Hey y'all, welcome to Miss Clark's chemistry class. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about solutions. Actually, I'm going to record a whole series on solutions. There's a lot to know. This lesson is going to be the basics. Definitions of solution, how you make a solution, properties of a solution. So make sure and go get your notes, get something to write with, and let's get started. Now we've talked about this word solution, but man, that was a long time ago. A solution is a homogeneous mixture. Let's remember about a mixture first of all. A mixture is when two substances share the same place, but there's no chemical reaction happening. They're just sharing the same space at the same time. It's a physical blend. And a homogeneous mixture is where these substances blend together and they completely evenly distribute out between each other. So it just looks like the same substance throughout the container, even though there's multiple substances blended together. Now, every single solution is going to be composed of a solute and a solvent. The solute is what's being dissolved, and the solvent is doing the dissolving. So if the solute is being dissolved, then it will always be present in the lesser amount. Sometimes when you look at a solution and the solute and the solvent are given to you, sometimes it's hard to tell which one is the solute and the solvent, and you have to depend on the amounts given to define each as the solute and the solvent. So if you're ever struggling, the solute is always the one present in the lesser amount. The solvent is always going to be the one in the greater amount. And that makes sense. If something is going to be dissolved, there's gotta be less of it. And if something is going to do the dissolving, then there needs to be more of it. Let's go ahead and talk about the universal solvent. The universal solvent is water, H2O. Water is a universal solvent because let's remember something very special about water. It's polar. If we draw water out, we've got our little Mickey Mouse. And remember, polar means that the electrons in the bond are shared unequally. And since oxygen is more electronegative, it's gonna pull the electrons closer to it, so oxygen is going to feel slightly negative. Hydrogen, since it's had its electrons pulled away from it, it's going to be left feeling slightly positive. This slightly negative and slightly positive property of water, that polarity, that is what gives water the ability to dissolve many, many, many substances and why it is deemed the universal solvent. First, let's talk about how an ionic compound dissolves in water. Now, when ionic compounds dissolve in water, they completely disassociate. Disassociate, that just means comes apart. Let's take a look and see what that looks like using a model. These are water molecules, H2O. Two H's, one O. And let's remember that water is polar. Oxygen is more electronegative. That means it's going to pull the electrons closer to itself, and it's gonna feel a little bit negative. Hydrogen, since the electrons were pulled away from hydrogen, that's gonna leave hydrogen feel slightly positive. For our ionic compound, we're gonna use salt, NaCl, where Na is a metal with a positive charge. Chlorine is a non-metal with a negative charge. But when it's in its crystal structure, those charges are all locked up. What happens when salt is dissolved into water? Chlorine is negative. This green represents chlorine. And if you notice, it attracted the slightly positive hydrogen. And then if we get closer, oh, it's going to attract. The pull of the water molecules are going to break apart the crystal. And the water molecules are going to encircle each ion because once that crystal comes apart, now sodium and chlorine are not atoms of sodium and atoms of chlorine, it's ions with positive and negative charges. So see how the water molecules have pulled off one sodium, one chlorine? Remember, when things dissolve, they don't disappear. If we were to take a sip of salt water, it still is salty because the salt is still there. The only thing is the water molecules have evenly dispersed all of the ions in the solution. And so you can't see it anymore and it looks like it's invisible. So if we were looking at something like this, we would still see salt particles here. We would still see white crystals floating around until they are all completely disassociated. Ionic compounds completely disassociate. Let's see what that looks like. 
Okay, so the water has come in, pulled all of the ions out of the crystal, and has evenly distributed all of those ions throughout the mixture. Because remember, a solution is a homogeneous mixture. Or your solid might be polar covalent. Polar covalent molecules, they do dissolve in water because of those partial positives and negatives, but they do not disassociate. Again, I have another visual of that using a model. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so the polar covalent molecule we're gonna use is ethanol. So let's pour some ethanol into our water. Now, ethanol has an OH group. So oxygen and hydrogen, OH, that oxygen is going to feel slightly negative because it's pulling those electrons. Hydrogen's gonna be left feeling a little positive. So when the ethanol comes into the water, We can see how the water is attracted to the ethanol molecule and so it's going to evenly disperse it. Since it's covalent, the particles don't disassociate. So we see water molecules are attracted to the polar end of the molecule, not attracted to the nonpolar end of the molecule. And so the water does not disassociate the polar covalent molecule. So it's going to dissolve because we've got this attraction here, but it's not a good electrolyte because we're not pulling these charges apart like we would an ionic compound. Lastly, let's talk about nonpolar molecules. Now, when I say molecule, that means covalent compounds. Remember, that kind of goes back a little ways. A molecule is held together with covalent bonds. So a nonpolar molecule is a nonpolar covalent molecule. Now, nonpolar covalent molecules they do not dissolve. And since there's no dissolving taking place, they are definitely not disassociating. I have another model of that. Let's take a look. For my nonpolar covalent molecule, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use methane, CH4, nonpolar. The electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen, so close together, the electrons are shared equally. And if we bring some methane into our solution, there's no force of attraction between the molecules because there's no partial positive, there's no partial negative. And so what's going to happen is when these come in, they're pushing those water molecules together. And the water molecules are attracted to each other. So the water molecules are gonna be attracted to each other, but nothing is going to be attracted to the nonpolar covalent molecule. And so this is how we get an immiscible solution. This nonpolar covalent molecule is gonna form a layer, and then the water is gonna form a layer. Does not dissolve because there's no force of attractions. A nonpolar molecule does not have any slightly positives or slightly negatives. No dissolving. Okay, so let's review real quick. Ionic compounds, they dissolve because they completely disassociate in water because of those charges. Polar covalent molecules, they do dissolve because they've got those partial charges, but they do not disassociate. Nonpolar covalent molecules, they not only do not dissolve, they do not disassociate. And the main reason why a nonpolar does not disassociate is there's no partial charges. Let's talk about some vocabulary words that we can use to describe solutions. So the first vocabulary word I wanna talk about is miscible. Let's go ahead and talk about both of these at the same time, miscible and immiscible. I kind of think these words sound like mixable and immixable. We know this prefix M, that's like the opposite, it means not. And even though miscable is not mixable, if you think about it, it helps you to understand the word. A miscible solution this is a solution where all of the solute is going to dissolve, all the particles are going to evenly disperse throughout the entire solution and give us that homogeneous mixture. So I'm gonna say particles dissolve, they evenly disperse, and since they evenly disperse, this is a homogeneous mixture. Immiscible. You might have already started to guess about what immiscible means. Immiscible, since we've got that prefix not, these particles are not going to completely dissolve. In fact, they're not going to dissolve at all. So we've got no dissolving. The particles aren't going to evenly disperse. We're going to see distinct layers. A really common immiscible 
solution, oil and water. If you think about oil and water, they're not going to dissolve. They're going to form layers. You know what? I've got an example of that. Let me show you. So here's an example of immiscible. We can see that these two liquids layer out. I can shake it up, try to get the blue and the clear to mix together. And if we leave this sitting long enough, it is going to completely separate out. I mean, look, it's already practically separated. Immiscible. Here I've got sugar water. I've put a couple of sugar cubes in, stirred it up. You can't tell the difference between clear water, sugar water. This is a miscible solution. The particles are so small, evenly distributed, you can't even tell that there's a solute in the solvent creating a solution. Okay, I've got some other vocabulary words. Let's talk about electrolytes and non-electrolytes. Again, we have two words that are opposites of each other. Electrolytes, did you just think of Gatorade? That's the most common selling point of Gatorade. Anytime you hear commercials about Gatorade, they always talk about their electrolytes. They really want you to buy into the fact that electrolytes are good for you, you need them, and Gatorade has them. Let's talk about exactly what an electrolyte is. Okay, so let's look at this word, electrolyte. Something that should probably jump right out at us is that the first part of the word is electro. That makes us think of electricity. An electrolyte is a substance that when you dissolve it, so it's the solute, it conducts electricity. Let's think about how that's possible. We've got sodium chloride, salt, which by the way is a good electrolyte. We've already looked at an example of how NaCl completely disassociates in water. Well, when it completely dissociates in water, it exposes the sodium plus cation and the chlorine minus anion, we've got charges floating around in this water. So now we have our water and we've got, we've got pluses floating around, we've got negatives floating around, and really that's all electricity is, is the movement of charges, the movement of electrons, the movement of protons, charges. And you might be thinking, and why is that important that Gatorade has electrolytes? I don't understand why conducting electricity is so important to the inside of my body. Gatorade is really only good after those workouts that are very, very strenuous. And you sweat and you sweat and you sweat. I know we might not purposely taste our sweat, but you know when you're working out hard, sweat rolls into your mouth all the time. Most of us already realize that our sweat tastes, that's right, salty. We're losing salt as we sweat. Salt is very important. And I'm using salt as a general term. Remember, salts are ionic compounds. So we're sweating, we're sweating out these salts. These salts are responsible for our brain impulses. Our neurons run on electricity. That action potential and the sodium pumps and the potassium pumps that are all in our neurons that cause the electrical pulses to run through the neurons. And then the neurons hit our muscles and then that causes all those calcium channels to open and allows our muscles to move and contract and release. All of that, all of that is ran on an internal electricity. And when we run out of electrolytes, that's when we start really feeling fatigued and our muscles start feeling fatigued. We start getting cramps because we need those electrolytes to run our nervous system and our muscular system. So when you sweat profusely and you lose all of those salts, that's why you start feeling a little mental fatigue and muscular fatigue. We need to put some back in our body. Ionic compounds, these are very good electrolytes. And it all comes down to ionic compounds completely disassociating in water. And we know this prefix non. Non is against, opposite, no. So these are compounds that when dissolved in water, they're not going to conduct electricity. Not conducting electricity because they don't disassociate. So let's go back and think. What types of compounds do not disassociate? Molecules do not disassociate. Remember? Covalent molecules, anything held together with a covalent bond, we're sharing those electrons, no disassociation, no disassociation, no conducting electricity. I have an example of this too. Let me show you. So let's go back to my sugar water again. Sugar is a covalent compound. When you dissolve sugar in water, it does not disassociate. Let's test and see if sugar water is an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte. Oh, sugar water, a non-electrolyte. I have another solution, salt water. Salt, that's an ionic compound, NaCl. Let's test and see if salt water is an electrolyte. Oh wow, 
those particles, those sodiums and those chlorines, they do become disassociated. They free up their charges and look, they conduct electricity. Pretty cool, huh? We should feel really good about what is a solution, what's the parts of a solution, and then some basic properties of a solution. Don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss this entire series. Until next time, bye y'all.